Hey, welcome to another post Tweet Jam takeaways. And joining me today is Daniel Glenn. Hello. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Well, this is a great topic. This is an interesting topic. And it's uh, in some ways a little bit of departure where usually we'll focus in on like a specific technology. This one was uh, there's one question that's specifically around technology. And of course, we're both biased. We work heavily within the Microsoft ecosystem. There's Microsoft Viva and that side of it. But the topic was insights and analytics around employee well-being. And it's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting topic. It's a very interesting topic. And it's not, um, it's not something that is even um, solely in the technology realm. You know, people who are dealing with technology all, the, all day. It's when we're talking about well-being, we're talking about... Um, any any kind of vertical that you're in, you could be in healthcare, you could be in you could be in business, you could be in finance, whatever. But also, it's every part of your life, right? It's not just work. Um, so how really how that all pieces together really does make it complex. Well, it's, I, I've for a long time, I, you know, I've been a leadership development and a management book, you know, a, a junkie of those that the books and read that kind of stuff. And I, I'm really passionate around uh, people management and leadership, you know, type things and developing those skills and, and also recognizing that just because especially those of us that work in tech, just because you're good at technology does not mean that you should automatically, hey, promote you to a manager to where you're in charge of other people's lives. Uh, I'm sure most people watching have had this experience where I've worked for managers who were brilliant, with technology in the business who should have never, ever been in charge of another human being. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, and that came out in the conversation we had as part of the tweet jam, people were saying, you know, um, talking about their experiences with their managers and how their managers didn't have those conversations with them as far as, you know, how, do you, you know, having those one-on-ones and it not be about, well, what did you do for this project or what did you do? For, you know, it's, it's that, that's, um, that's task-based, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations. And that's not really what brings well-being, I think, um, right. to a relationship um, uh, in an organization. So, well, that's what we're going to get into. So let's start with question number one. Uh, so within the modern workplace, what are the primary factors that influence well-being? Yeah, and I kind of focused on, and I think this is what we all need to do, and hopefully you're going to hear a theme from me on any of these, is it's my answers. <laughs> uh, because right. we all have to find our place of what makes, uh, makes us tick and then match that with then what is that well-being? What, what does that bring us um, that uh, peace and that joy, right, in our in our work. So I measure it in: uh, Did I complete my tasks? That's one way. Meaning, I don't like to leave things on the table. Uh, you know, I don't like to leave my workspace and have tasks that I should have done. Okay, so that's one way. Another is: um, Did I communicate well? Did I did I communicate with my customers with my uh, employees with um, others uh, in the my work. Um, did I communicate with them well? Did we have build relationships? Was there any issues that were not communicated well, and I should do better? Right. So if there is, then that's something that it does affect me, um, yeah. and does it have balance for me? Um, as a consultant, another way is: is my customers happy? You know, if I have customers that are that are not happy with me, whether it's something I can do, I can fix or not, <laughs> um, then uh, that's going to affect my well-being. Um, the and the last is, I know this is I've said happy, but uh, I am I happy? You know, at the end of the day, I can be tired. That's fine. I mean, it's work, right? But am I happy with um, what I did? Am I and, and if I am, then I really consider myself um, and those things influence, am I well? You know, how, what is the level of well-being, I guess, for me? You know, it, it's it, when you have a healthy relationship with your manager uh, and, and maybe some people don't like the, you know, this, this uh, comparison, but I think about it like when, like I, I know my, as a, as a parent, I mean, I know my kids, I know when that's, that's just 
them tired. That's what that mm-hmm. talking is. That's what that attitude is. Uh, you know, it's the, it's not out of anger or spite or something where they're they're just you know they're frustrated by this. They're they're just tired. Like I can, but I, I you know close enough to them to know that. And I found where uh, where I was in either as a manager or as someone being managed, where I was happiest were in organizations where I was close enough to the manager to recognize, to have those kinds of conversations, to be able to say that there's, I mean, because this influenced my well-being is when, you know, for a manager to be like, you know, a, a great conversation, great example, one of my first tech jobs where I was similar to you. I didn't want to leave tasks, things that were open, but I was working longer hours. I actually came in on a Saturday getting things done. And this man, this this boss, the owner of the company, just said, look, like, this is not right. You need to be with your, spending your weekend with your family. Um, you, you, you shouldn't be working. This. It either means that we have too much on your plate, and that's fine, He's like, Let, let's, but let's, you know, maybe give some things to other people, or we need to hire somebody else because we're doing well, we're making money, you know, but we just, we're understaffed for what we need to go and do. And so you, it, but he was, you know, present enough and aware enough in, in the depth of the conversations to recognize that there was that going on and knew that it was, I was on my, on the path to burnout. I was going so yeah and and that really does um lead us to uh, the other questions and and i think you know for that was a really good flow for this time um because um you know not you got to know how what are those things that impact it but then how do you track it you know and how do you measure that well that's Um, question number two that's right so let's jump into it so how do you track and measure employee well-being today well i I really think um, it is, and it really is up to uh, managers for a large portion of this. Um, And it does speak to good managers, bad managers. You know, I think a lot of it is training and, 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 and and, uh, direction on how people can be built up to be managers, but it really is up to you to, as a manager, to have those conversations with your people and to understand where they are. And that that if you have a toxic relationship with your employees, then that's going to have a huge impact, right? And you're not going to be able to track and measure because people are not going to be open with you. Right. Um, but getting to a point where your employees are are able to tell you, listen, I, I'm struggling, right? I, and not fear for their job, not yeah. fear that they're going to get docked for you know, a performance review just because they're struggling, you know, being able to have that conversation um, is, I think, vital. And so having that type of relationship and measuring that is managers really tracking that. How are how are conversations going with them? You're having one on ones with them, with your people, you know, check ins. Are they, uh, you know, recently have they been negative? Have they been overwhelmed have you have they been sending emails at the wrong time you know at night and early yep. in the morning <laughs> you know yep. um and then really i think this hybrid work has you know the hybrid environment where uh, either some or all uh, if everyone is is um working remotely it really makes it even more difficult to figure out um how to get that engagement with the with your people you know, I always thought of this too, because I, I know that some of the other things that were discussed during the tweet jam were like, uh, you know, like a lot of companies, especially bigger organizations, enterprises do like the annual employee satisfaction surveys. And there's some data that you can pull from that. And uh, they're, they're usually anonymous or mostly anonymous. And so, you know, the the feedback I don't know, people like to try to answer, I mean, surveys, they, they get the extremes, the polar extremes That's right. in there. And, yeah. and and where you get the, probably the most truth is out of the uh, the the open end of the, the essay questions where people can input things. That's where you can really see what's going on. Well, and, and yeah. I think from, a, from an engagement, from a manager perspective, you know, having those conversations with their people and not just their people, with your peers as well, is listening. You know, it's not a time to tell, 
It's not a time to, you know, if you really want to gauge how people are feeling, how their how their well being, right? If you want to gauge that, then you really have to listen uh, and be able to pick up on what is being said, but also how it's being said. You know, yeah. I think that there's there's a danger in this question around tracking and measuring. And part mm -hmm. of it is this idea that there are plenty of people out there that's like, well, we'll just we can build it into a dashboard and the the data will tell us everything that we need to know. And I mean, most of the responses, I mean, what you're saying, the way I interpret that, it, it and I agree, is that it is it's the harder, the more difficult path, which is to actually talk to people. Yeah. Well, I mean, later on, and we'll talk about this using the technology to, you know, maintain and improve well-being. But um, I feel like technology, it, it it's always just a tool um, in this cog. <laughs> it's yeah. it's in this in this wheel. Uh, it's just a tool to to facilitate something. And while we are a lot of us are remote still, uh, not all of us, okay, but while a lot of us are still remote. Um, we're going to have to use that technology. We're going to have to use that to have those connections, but it's still just, it's still human connection. Um, yeah. I don't think there's any way to, just because I'm sending email at nine o'clock at night, doesn't mean, doesn't mean I'm, my well being's off. It doesn't mean it necessarily, right? Yeah. It can, but it, it actually doesn't mean that um, for yeah. everybody. So we, well, you have to have that connection to interpret, right? Well, that's too. It's, it's like, I'm like I have a, a global role. I'm usually have uh, at least a couple of nights a week. I have late night calls with with APAC, so I'm on the phone with people in Australia and Singapore and elsewhere. Uh, and and so people might look at my calendar and be like, "You have calls scheduled at seven and eight p.m. What's what's going on?" Yeah, it's like, and your it's tools just, may yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, to say, oh, you're you're bad. You know, you're you're working bad hours. You should stop that. Yeah, no. So there has to be that connection. So question three is, what are the leading risks for employee well-being, and how does or should your organization mitigate those risks? Well, I, you know, when we talk about well-being, I mean, the number one thing that comes to mind is burnout, and to me, that means working too hard for too long. Um, and not having meaningful breaks. Um, and this is a term that I think is very important as we talk about how organizations can be a part of the well-being of employees. But to let's step back to say, you know, we there are periods for me at least, um, and others that I've talked to where you just have to work hard. There, you know, there's days, weeks where you, you're yeah. gonna work more than what might be considered a normal work week. Um, just to, to make things happen. Right. Um, that's fine. That can be fine. But when those turn into months, right. And quarters, and then you look back, wow, I just spent a year of working, you know, way too much. Then, um, you know, from an organization perspective, they're not getting as much value out of me if that's the case, because, um, you know, the, the, the kind of trade-off of that is uh, I'm going to get burnout and either I'm going to stop provi uh, providing good quality product or services, or I'm going to go somewhere else because, you know, that whole grass is greener on the other side. Uh, well, quick that, tip, that, it's not, but. <laughs> well, well that's, a, is that, and that's actually great because we have the, this, the great resignation that's going on mm -hmm. now where a lot of it is how it's interpreted is, um, and I, and I agree with that. It's, you know, people that are saying, Hey, during this, this period where everybody is looking to hire somebody, they're having a difficult time finding people like, why am I staying put in this crappy job where I'm poorly treated Yeah. or, or I'm not making what I feel I'm worth. Yeah. And yeah. it's fun. It's funny though, because I also, um, I, you know, all this stuff is cyclical, right? I was mm -hmm. reading an article last week that was talking about um, some, a survey came out that people, there was a great percentage. It was 30 something percent regret leaving their company during this great resignation. Um, so the grass is not always green on the other side. You can be in a toxic work environment and you probably should leave. Um, sure. But 
you know, I, I feel like organizations can do things like making meaningful breaks a priority. It's not going to solve everything, but a meaningful break, um, Again, this goes back to that connection. It's not necessarily the same thing for everybody, but it includes things like uh, making sure that we're not having back to back to back to back meetings all day long, right? There should be periods of time during the day where you don't have meetings. Um, there should be uh, respect for work hours, uh, whatever those work hours are. There should be respect for time off and expected time off, right? Meaning yeah. managers going, wait, you haven't had a day off in six months. This is not helpful. Right. You have to take time off. Well, right? One of my favorite, uh, one of my pet peeves was having uh, time and funds made available per employee for, for going and doing training each year. Mm -hmm. But then the perception was that if people utilized that funding, which was set aside annual basis for employees, but if you actually used it, it was looked as a negative on your profile and your career trajectory. Like there's something yeah. messed up about that where we, yeah. you know. Well, we, I think um, it's kind of on the flip side. You take that same concept, but look at it the other way. Um, my first uh, IT job uh, out, right out of college, it was like a badge of honor that you had vacation days left over at the end of the year. Right. That you, oh, I've got two weeks left over. Like, wait, you have two weeks left over and you don't get to use them. It, how was that a badge of honor? Yeah. When I was younger. So here's the difference. When I was younger and newly married and broke and a new, you know, baby that was in, you know, in the house and, and a brand new mortgage. I was, I found out that I was able to unused vacation days, get the cash for it. Some, yeah, some companies made that do decision. That. That's right. And I made the decision to do that. So it was, right. a, it was a conscious thing, but otherwise I agree that like you should force people to use their vacation and to take a break. Well, and it, and it be, again, it's relationship. It really is. And to know your people and to know um, how that will uh, really work with them and be beneficial for everybody. Um, so I, I think it is very important to have meaningful breaks, um, uh, little ones all the way up to, you know, days off. It's funny. It's like, so it's another answer where we also kind of worked in there. It's like, if you're having regular conversations with, with people on your team, your peers, your direct reports, your manager, you're going to know about this stuff. It's just a natural thing that happens. It's like sales. The more yeah, phone yeah. calls you make, the, the, the greater that you increase your chances of making a sale. Mm -hmm. It's just a simple numbers game. If you're having the conversations, if you're having the interactions with, then you're more likely to know about, you know, family issues or mm -hmm. health issues or just being stressed out by volume of work or, you know, hey, no, they are working long hours, but they're just like they've got OCD and ADD and this, they love it, you know, like leave them alone. They're good, you know, but you know yeah. that if you're having, if you have that relationship. For sure. And I, and you know, when they want to take a different direction in their career, right. And you, you know, maybe they want to add a little bit of this or a little bit of that in what they're doing in their role uh, that can make them so much more happier because it's something that they enjoy. And really bring up their well-being in the organization. And it could be just something so simple and beneficial to everybody. Question four was, what is the difference between productivity and engagement? And how does your organization view each? Um, so I think productivity is tasks. You know, how, how many th widgets did you make? How many calls did you make? Um, you know, how many sites did you create? You know, I, I feel like productivity is really focused on numbers and where you, did you get the thing done? Right. Um, you know, engagement, um, I believe really involves, it's kind of, the word that kept coming to my mind was presence. Um, hmm. It's really, it is being there. You know, it's being attentive to what's going on and knowing what's going on. It's being available to have conversations, to mm -hmm. jump in when needed. Um, 
and really being um, approachable of, of being open, you know, literally have an open door policy of, you know, someone can come and talk to you and, um, and just being there, being part of the action, I guess, I, uh, I think is, I, I think it's much the same way. It's it, it, the quantitative, the things you measure and the qualitative activities. I, Cause that's the, I guess the hard part is for, and I've heard of plenty of organizations that have started to talk about increasing engagement. And I was, my first question to that is like, well, what do you actually mean by that? Mm -hmm. How are yeah. you defining engagement? Because are you measuring it? Are you just swapping the name with productivity right. and treating it the same way? Or and, and so there's organizations that are like, no, no, no. We're we're trying to realize it's a, it's a more esoteric thing. Here's how we're defining it and trying to measure, track, and measure that. Yeah, because you can be you can be um, engaged. And not productive, but you, vice versa too. You can be productive and not engaged. And I think there is a balance. Um, I think organizations want productivity, <laughs> right? But in the long run, uh, productivity without engagement uh, doesn't get you the success. You know, you can't really obtain that level of success that you could have if you had a great balance of both. Does your company track engagement? We do not using technology. Again, it's mm. relationship. So mm -hmm. things like uh, having all company meetings or having our scrums and having those one on ones, you know, it, really gauging that. And um, I'll tell you, I've missed a few of those meetings because I've had other things I had to attend to. Um, and, uh, you know, getting three or four people ping me, hey, saw that you weren't in that meeting. <laughs> what's up with that? You know, what's going on? What do you need? Yeah. You know, what, you know, I think that type of, uh, and that's them being engaging, right? We right. we're talking about me not being engaging because I wasn't there, that presence, but that's them engaging me to make sure that there's nothing wrong to make sure, Hey, is there something I can take off your plate, you know, to, to help you. Um, so it, Technology is nice and and we each individuals can use technology to track those kind of things. And I think it probably is good, you know, use OneNote or something to to jot down your notes about your conversations with people. But um, but uh, it really is relationship. I agree. Uh, let's yeah. see. Uh, question number five. What is the role of community and collaboration in your organizational strategy? For employee well-being, so this kind of plays off of that. I mean, you just talked a bit about more of the community aspect of that. I mean, is that actually part of your company strategy? So I took this as in two, two kind of lanes. One is that, uh, yes, that I don't know if it's strategy or if it's just the way we do things. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, um, you know, there's not a policy. You know, being on the on the leadership team, we don't sit there and go, well, we we need to be engaged and we need to do this. It's just kind of the way it's we part do of the, it. your culture. Yeah, it is. It yeah. really is. Um, now, if your organization doesn't have that in your culture, then you're probably going to need a strategy, right, to help yeah. um, your managers and your directors to to figure that out. Um, What's a lot of but, culture is just it is. It, it, it's the practice of, uh, you know, what are the habits, mm -hmm. you know, and so there are healthy and unhealthy habits. And so that's the, the you know, kind of as you point out to change the culture, it starts with like that strategy and repeatable activities and encouraging people to to do certain ways, and then it just becomes part of the way that your company operates. Exactly. Um, the second kind of lane I took this in was also community outside of the organization, and I it it is it really does bring um, it is a part of that well being of uh, I am I can be part of something that's bigger than me, you know, that's not part of this work. So being part of a community, whether that's a community that is boxing up, food, you know, put together food boxes for the needy, um, or that's uh, tutoring kids uh, in uh, special districts, or, it, or that's technical community, all the above, whatever, but being part of that community uh, experience, I think, helps in the workplace as well. Not just from what I learn, but it's those experiences and and it grounds you, right? And and makes you connected. So I think that's a very important. 
it is very important. And so, and that the so here's the technology question. Question six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how can organizations leverage technology to maintain or improve employee well-being? Well, I, you know, I think we we let's go ahead and mention Viva. You know, um, Viva Insights I think can help here. Um, I heard uh, real-world experience Viva Insights where uh, you can look to see well a, a, sh a particular group in an organization where they were not having one-on-ones. Managers were not having them at all. So you mm. can tell, oh, you're not doing that. So let's talk about doing those. So you can start having those connections, right? Um, it, it's maybe a little forced initially, but, you know, um, making it to where it becomes part of the, that culture of that small group, right? Or that department that wasn't doing it. Um, so technology can happen, uh, can help. Right, and it can help in this well-being uh, and help maintain that. Um, but I think you know, as we are, I feel like we're going to stay hybrid moving forward. Mostly, you know, in those um, organizations that can uh, stay, they're going to be hybrid. There's going to be people who go are in offices, but then there's going to be people at home or working remotely. And I think that's going to uh, necessitate having technology and using technology to connect us and to make sure that we're connected and to uh, really improve the way we work with each other and to keep that well-being up. Um, so, you know, using Microsoft Teams, of course, um, or, you know, comparable technology, but uh, being able to have those conversations and uh, staying in touch is going to be very important. But we have to be, I think, very mindful of um, how we use those to listen. You know, I said I mentioned that earlier, but how can we use technology to hear other people um, rather than push our message out? Is how can we use technology to hear them, whether it's surveys or yeah. it's those one-on-ones or in group settings? Um, how can we use technology to have team events together, you know? Um, I think that is going to be very important in what becomes this um, this this hybrid way of working from from now on. You know, one of the things that I do, I find myself more and more where I'll sit and we're having you know, a, a conversation and we're chatting, we're going back and forth. And I just I started just uh, it was like, like, can we just chat? Like we're sitting here typing and doing this. Yeah. We have the tool. It's the same tool. We're using Teams hit the button to the camera and have the conversation and have that interaction. And it, it is, uh, it's so much more meaningful uh, and, and to have that and to see a face and have that interaction than it is to sit there typing with people. I agree. And you don't get the inflection. You don't get the body language. Right. You don't get, um, right. we've really lost that. Um, yeah. And, and with, with technology, it can be a, a, a barrier to, you know, yes, you, it's easier to, to communicate via and have that text and everything. And, but sometimes it really is just, I need to see your face and I, I need to see the way you present this. And sometimes you can say something in text. And if it was just said in person or over video, um, it would have been much more well received than just through text of, of, um, you know, maybe it was something that they felt was critical or something like that. And so I agree with you. Turn on the video, um, at least turn on the audio and have a phone, you know, yep. or an audio call to do that. You know, I, 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 I've done like the, a lot of organizations that have done like the personality testing mm -hmm. and of the different styles and I'm very extroverted shocker, you know, <laughs> but I, I would be, would not be surprised to go and do it now two years after the, you know, into the pandemic and to see how many people that have gone more towards an introversion personality style, I, or we just have all become a bit more agoraphobic. We're just, you know, like, do I need to go outside? You know, and we used to joke, you know, we see all the mugs at the beginning of teams, like, you know, could that email have been a teams meeting or, you know, different plays on that. I've seen the other ways like, Hey, couldn't have that meeting been just an email, you know, yeah, on a mug yeah. as well. And, uh, and, and now it's almost like I want to wear a t-shirt that says like, did, did we really need to meet in person? <laughs> I was like, did I need to go outside? Uh, which just is where, just wear my pajama bottoms right. all day long, yeah. every day. 
<laughs> Which is very interesting because that is um, going outside is one of my points for uh, question number seven. Um, so uh, I think that's a very interesting point that you uh, because we you're right. We're you know, we've been working with our home for a lot of us. Our home has been our workplace. And so it's kind of this we're used to it. And you could go days and days just, you know, traveling to work and never step outside and never interact with anyone physically um, in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of uh, uh, in, in discussion, you know, with, and so I, I feel like um, it, we've got to figure out how we can move on and get over that. Right. And I, get to I, a point where it, it um, because human connection is very important. I think we've uh, a lot of people have been saying it and, it really is important. And so how do we reclaim that, but also realize that we're going to be using technology and we're going to be hybrid and all this, but how do we reclaim that? Yeah, I, it's, uh, I don't think that we are done with the adjustment of what hybrid is going to look like. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think it, I, I agree. It's going to be interesting and we need to, that's why I'm excited about so much focus certainly within the technology sector around this topic of health and well-being and how do we balance between these it's if nothing more it's it's uh, encouraging the conversation and just before we get to question 7 like here's a great i've i've shared this a number of times in different recordings but for a year of my life uh, living in Sacramento i commuted on a motorcycle like i rode dirt bikes a bit when i was a kid and stuff but for a year that was my vehicle i got rid of my car i drove a motorcycle rain or shine it was a short commute but i i did that I had some scary experiences commuting um well uh, uh, so about a year and then i came out to go to work one morning and somebody had backed in and crushed my bike while it was parked overnight and so it was done and I went and that weekend, bought a car and, and and didn't go back. What I happened afterwards is my entire life, that was, wow, 25 years ago. Uh, so young. But that I, <laughs> uh, I am much more aware of motorcycles on the road now. I make extra room for them. I like, I'm sensitive to that. And I think my, personally, I believe that since we all had this shared experience, so many people that had never worked from home, that never had to do so much through online collaboration communication, uh, being a remote worker for the last more than a decade, my teams have always been a coast away, like mm -hmm. far away. Uh, and so I was used to this, but well, a complaint that I had was that people would often forget about those of us that were remote and have mm -hmm. conversations for projects, initiatives that we owned or we drove, but they would go and do things and not keep us in the loop. And you can't do that, whether we're across the aisle from each other in cubicles or across the country around the world, we're working on a project like you need to be aware of yeah. who are my stakeholders, who's the conversations. And I think collectively, we just took a, a couple steps up, improved in, in that. And I, I, I hope that, I would, that sticks. I would agree with you. I, I've been doing the same uh, consulting for, I don't know, 12 years now, whatever it is. And a vast majority of that was not in, in the office, was not at the client side even. It was remote. And sometimes just feeling left out you know, because there was an office and decisions being made. <laughs> when I'd go into the office, I'd be brought into those decisions or in those conversations. But when I wasn't there, I wasn't. And it was just, for you know, out of sight, out of mind. And I, I agree with you. I think people have gotten the idea that um, you have to remember there's other people there and their voice is important uh, and their experience is important. And their ex life experiences, work experiences can really help with that um, diversity uh, that we're going to need uh, when we tackle all these types of issues, whether it's work issues or client issues, um, you know, customer issues. So I think it's very important. Well, final question here that we covered. So when building an employee well-being strategy, what three factors should organizations include within their planning? And I cheated. I did four because um, I did yeah. three and then I did a bonus. But um, overachiever. 
<laughs> See, you could have you could have left off early by just leave that fourth one off. No, no, I got to keep working. Um, the first is, and I mentioned it before, is meaningful time off, and I talked about what that is, but um, really meaningful time off. Um, when you take time off, do something other than thinking about work. Don't bring your, your laptop to Hawaii. Right. Not that I ever did that. Not that you've never done. <laughs> um, so making sure that you recharge your batteries, as yeah. they say, right? Um, and then number two is outside time. Um, I really do feel like, uh, I feel bad when I don't go outside, when mm. I, at least a little bit per day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really brings me down if I'm inside like at conferences and everything else, if you're always, but you know, at home, just being inside. And um, I've rearranged my office now to where there's a window right there. And I can look out the window, um, just be outside, do something yeah. outside to get that time. And then the third thing I said is really focus on less stress engagements. And what I really mean by that is um, understanding what you're thinking about, what you're stressing about, what you're agonizing about um, it, for most of us is not life altering. It is most of us. It's not. Uh, life or death, you know, it is something that um, for me anyway, I bring stress on myself that I don't need. So don't bring stress to you that you really don't need. Focus on what you can do and when you can do it. The bonus was have social engagement um, yeah. and, you know, really provide support, an organization providing support for their employees to have social engagement with each other but also outside, um, whether that's conferences or that's uh, making sure, you know, in those conversations you're having with each other that, you know, when people don't talk about having social engagements at all, invite them to yours, right? But, you know, it's, and remember, it's about connection. Um, and I think that's important. Well, Daniel, really appreciate you participating in the Tweet Jam. Again, always welcome for, for everybody that, uh, you know, these monthly Tweet Jams are, uh, you know, there, Daniel, it's great having you here. Of course, there were 31 other people also participating, all with great input. Yeah, it's, uh, great. I get so much from the, you know, uh, sometimes the validation of ideas, sometimes it's like, you know, I've never thought of it that way, or mm -hmm. I that scenario or that industry. It's just great to participate. So um, love having those community discussions. But with that, thank you for helping uh, with this uh, closing topic uh, for this last month and hope to see you at the next one. All right. Thank you so much.